Good evening, everybody. And uh, I have to say, personally, I traveled in from Boston yesterday, and if I heard nothing else other than Seamus Mallon this evening, it would have been well worthwhile. So this marvelous Kennedy Summer School is off to a wonderful start. And now we have the pl pleasure of participating in the Edward M. Kennedy Lecture. And it's my privilege and honor to be able to introduce our distinguished respondents and our esteemed keynote speaker as well. And I'm going to introduce us all together at the same time, if I can. I'm pinch hitting for Robert Mauro, my friend and colleague from Boston College, who sadly was taken seriously ill yesterday morning, or morning before at Dublin Airport, and had to return immediately to Boston. So let's keep uh, Bob in our prayers and, uh, and remember him and his family this time. So if we can get my notes together here, I'm going to introduce our esteemed panel. Myself, I'm Thomas Groom. Uh, I went away out of this country almost 50 years ago. I'd love to tell you that I was in my mother's arms as a baby, but in fact, I was 22 years of age, so you can do the math if you like. I stumbled into university and did master's and doctoral work and then was offered a position at Boston College for one year. And that was 42 years ago, so I've never come home. Except, well, I have, of course. I've come home every summer. I've been home many, many times and indeed have stayed in touch with this Irish context. So while I'm in some ways, I'm an outsider, I'm also, I'm coming certainly from the inside. Our two wonderful panelists this evening, Senator Ivana Batchik is a bar barrister and the Reed Professor of Criminal Law and Criminology and Penology at Trinity College Dublin. She is a senator, uh, Shana Aaron, for Dublin University, elected in 2007, re-elected 2011, and again re-elected in 2016, and I bet she'd be re-elected the next time as well. Uh, her research, pardon? <laughs> Her research interests include criminal law, criminology, and feminist theories of law. Then our second panelist and respondent is Michael Kelly, and there's a little bit about Michael in the, in the, in the brochure. He's a distinguished author and writer and journalist. He's the publisher of the Irish Catholic newspaper. Michael grew up in County Tyrone, uh, went to St. Patrick's Oma for, high school, for secondary school, Maynooth for a BA and a BD, and then on to Rome to Sancta Cruce University for his STL, his uh, licentiate in theology. And then Archbishop, I do it, how tired it is, yes. Archbishop uh, Eamon Columba Martin. Eamon was born in Derry in 1961 to uh, the one of 12 children to parents from Inish Owen in County Donegal. He studied for the priesthood at St. Patrick's College, Maynooth, he did postgraduate work at Queen's University Belfast at uh, University of Cambridge. He was ordained in 1987. After a stint of parish work in Derry, he was appointed to St. Columns College where he taught mathematics and religious education, near and dear to my own heart, and then served as principal of St. Columns for eight or 10 years. Uh, about 2008, he was made executive secretary of the Irish Bishops' Conference returned to Derry briefly, and then in 2014, Pope Benedict XVI appointed him among then Monsignor Eamon as Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of Ireland. In that role, Archbishop Eamon is also the President of the Irish Episcopal Conference and Co-Chair of the Council for Marriage and Family. Let's give them all a round of applause. I hear about When we talk about religion and politics, are we talking about oil and water? Uh, or, in fact, are we talking through things that should never be mixed and, in fact, would be diminished by the mixing? Or are we into a new moment? The, the sociologists talk to us that we're moving out of modernity into post-modernity. And there are at least initial signs that the postmodern era is calling for a different kind of conversation, a more fruitful conversation, a dialectical conversation. In other words, if you follow Plato's meaning of dialectic, a genuine give and take where politics and faith can enhance each other. So we may be at the start of a new moment, and uh, great conversations like this can help to catalyze that moment. But let me begin with a story. It was a Monday night in Houston, September 12, 1960, 
and see some 300 evangelical leaders had awaited the young presidential candidate, John F. Kennedy, to address them, and foolishly, he kept them waiting over an hour. He was to address them precisely on what Kennedy himself termed his religious affiliation. When Kennedy first presented himself as a candidate, the pundits immediately recalled the overwhelming defeat of Al Smith in 1928, and the pundits definitely agreed that he was defeated precisely because he was Catholic. But yet Kennedy had won well in Wisconsin, the primary there against Hubert Humphrey, a state where the voters were equally divided, Protestant and Catholic. And then to people's amazement, he went on to win West Virginia with 95% of the voters there being Protestant. It looked like that Kennedy's problem as a Catholic had been put to rest. But then, after Kennedy achieved the nomination, two powerful Protestant leaders, Billy Graham and Norman Vincent Peale, mounted a national movement against Kennedy, finding his Catholic religion to be, quote, problematic for serving as President of the United States. At first, Kennedy ignored the issue, but as opposition gathered momentum, he knew that he would have to address it. Ted Sorensen, a close Kennedy aide and advisor, wrote the previous day, quote, we can win or lose the election right here in Houston on Monday night. Clearly, it had become a make or break issue. Kennedy began by listing the social issues that were central to his campaign, better, better schools, better jobs, better health care, etc. But then he noted, and I quote, but because I am a Catholic, and no Catholic has ever been elected President of the United States, the real issues in this campaign have been obscured. And so he said he felt the, ne the, no the need then, and I quote again, not to decide what kind of church I believe in, but rather what kind of America I believe in. He went on immediately, he summarized his, his posture, his essential posture. He said, I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute. And this means, I quote, that no public official either requests or accepts instruction or public policy from the Pope or from any other ecclesiastical leader. Let me just take a little water for a moment. Kennedy went on. I believe in a president whose religious views are his own private affair, neither imposed by him upon the nation or imposed by the nation upon him as a condition for holding the office. He declared boldly, I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president who happens to be Catholic. He closed with this dramatic assurance. He says, if in time, if some time should ever come when my office would require me to either violate my conscience or violate the national interest of my country, then I would resign the office immediately. Those evangelical clergy gave him a standing ovation and, as the saying goes, the rest is history. Kennedy's Houston speech was a turning point, and he went on to win the presidency. But while his position was pragmatically effective and understandable, perhaps, in the socio-political circumstances, did it, as, Mark, as historian Mark Massa proposes, did it encourage a secularization of American society? In other words, secularizing the society entirely and privatizing American religion as if it's something totally private for the private realm alone. Massa certainly thinks it did. And I quote again, Massa says that he put in place an exceedingly high and solid wall, this is what Kennedy did, between church and state, between faith and politics. But did he really? And if he did, was it wise? I have my doubts on both in response to both questions. For example, some 85% of Protestant evangelicals voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 presidential election and precisely on grounds of what they perceived to be his Christian values. <laughs> and to make things worse, it would appear that they're about to vote for him a second time in 2020, even after a so much counter evidence of Trump having any spiritual or faith values whatsoever. 
In other words, the wall is not nearly as high or as solid as we Americans might presume. But on a more positive note, and here's where I come to the emerging moments, I think, in postmodernity, there are many postmodern social commentators who seem to see a growing dis-ease with modernity's simplistic solution of a wall of separation between church and state, between faith and politics. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, one of its great primary architects, proposed that the citizen belongs to the state whereas the individual belongs to the church. Grand, lovely solution, but wasn't he forgetting there were only one person? Modernity presumed that enlightenment would indeed subtract religion out of society. Modernity is basically what we mean when you get a bit of education, you'll stop believing. They felt that faith would fade away as the irrational superstition of our grandparents, I suppose we might say pish rogues. But this was not, had not transpired. Some 85% of the world's population still claim some kind of religious affiliation. Charles Taylor, a great social commentary in our time, argues that belief and unbelief are now on level ground, each one being as equally credible and believable as the other. Many postmodern authors now are adopting a more positive appreciation of the need and the potential for spiritual grounding for any society. For example, Jürgen Habermas, a very noted German, uh, German uh, 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 philosopher and social commentator, proposes that society, every society, needs some kind of a spiritual grounding, a faith grounding, if it is to maintain a social ethic, if it's to motivate people, that we can know what is right and wrong simply from, from Kant's categorical imperative, but if we're to motivate people to do the right thing, that that is requiring some kind of spiritual resource of people, and that it's very difficult to convince people to, to respond to the, ethic, to the ethics of the public realm. And again, I'm digressing a little here, but Right now in the United States we have a whole bunch of leaders who are highly educated but have no moral compass whatsoever and don't know the difference between right and wrong. They're, they're increasingly, commentators are beginning to say, what we've lost is that spiritual faith grounding for a public morality. The noted French philosopher Francois Julien, describing himself as a non-believer, yet says that Christian personalism was really the foundation of the European Union and that without it, the Union is not likely to survive or to succeed. He says the Union's Christian roots are needed, says Julien, to counteract both the hard right and the hard left, both of which can be destructive, as history recently attests. So it might now be the time to renegotiate a dialectical partnership between religious faith and civil society, between faith and politics. I suspect that Archbishop Martin will so argue, and I would imagine that 60 years later, John F. Kennedy also might say, Amen. Bishop Martin, Archbishop Martin. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you. Forty years ago this month, Pope John Paul II came to Ireland. And I was just beginning my last year at school in St. Columns College in Derry. It was a very tense time. In the three months leading up to the Pope's visit, 36 people were killed in the Troubles, including 16 Catholic and Protestant civilians. And I went to see the Pope at Drogheda. And subconsciously, I think, his words on that occasion have possibly framed much of my thinking about this evening's theme, what is the role of faith in our politics? Pope John Paul II was stopping off in Ireland on his way to address the United Nations in New York on the theme of peace, justice and human rights. And he came to Drogheda, as he said himself, as a pilgrim of peace. And his message that day reiterated familiar themes from the visits he had already made to Mexico and Poland during the first year of his pontificate. He said, every human being has inalienable rights that must be respected. The moral law, guardian of human rights, protector of the dignity of man, cannot be set aside by any person or group or by the state itself for any cause. The law of God, he says, stands in judgment over all reasons of state. Pope John Paul II urged politicians that day, he described them as those who embrace the noble vocation of politics. He urged them to have the courage to face up to their responsibility to be leaders in the cause of peace, reconciliation and justice. Now, as a young 17-year-old, 
Many of these points went way over my head. But I distinctly remember the Holy Father's passionate appeal to those who were engaged in violence. He said, on my knees, I beg you to turn away from the paths of violence and to return to the ways of peace. I wonder in hindsight about the impact of Pope John Paul's words that day. Violence continued. Many more lives would be lost. And here we are, 40 years later, with no Northern Ireland Assembly, increasing sectarianism over the summer. And as Brexit looms, these islands going through a period of dangerous political, social and economic uncertainty. But still, for me, Pope John Paul's tone in Drogheda exemplifies the way in which faith can best speak into the public with confidence, courage, clarity and challenge, but also with humility and prayer, recognising that not everyone will hear or even be prepared to listen. Just before he left Ireland at Limerick, Pope John Paul reminded lay people that they are the ones who are called to insert the values of Christ into the reality of the world in which they live. The world of politics, media, science, technology, culture, education, industry and work. It's their task to permeate society from within with the leaven of the gospel. And he also pointed out that Ireland had difficult choices to make in the years ahead. He asked, will it be the way that many nations have gone, giving excessive importance to economic growth and material possessions while neglecting the things of the spirit? Will it be the way of substituting a new ethic of temporal enjoyment for the law of God? Will it be the way of false freedom, which is only slavery to decadence, he said? Will it be the way of subjugating the dignity of the human person to the totalitarian domination of the state? Ireland must choose, he said 40 years ago. Last summer, when Pope Francis visited this country for the world meeting of the families, he found a very changed Ireland. But Pope Francis's message to lay believers is not unlike that of his Polish predecessor. He says an authentic faith always involves a deep desire to change the world, to transmit values, to leave this earth somehow better than we found it. We love this magnificent planet on which God has put us. And we love the human family which dwells here. So, Pope Francis says, if the just ordering of society and of the state is a central responsibility of politics, the church cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the fight for justice. So it seems bringing faith to politics is therefore not an optional extra for the committed Christian. We are called to be faithful citizens, bearing witness in the public square, to scrutinize the signs of the times, listening all the while to our informed conscience, which is the voice of God speaking in our hearts, willing us towards the good and warning us against evil. Our faith makes us want to cry out at the extent of homelessness, poverty, addictions, violence, criminality and corruption on the streets of Ireland. Our faith moves us to weep that so many of our young people resort to self-harm and taking their own lives. Faith means we cannot ignore the plight of the refugee and those who are hungry, persecuted, trafficked and exploited in our world. Faith makes us rightly feel ashamed and repulsed by the horrific revelations of child abuse and other shameful episodes where the reputation of the church 
was put before the compassionate call of the gospel to protect the vulnerable and reach out to the marginalized. But faith also confronts us to examine our own lives and attitudes amidst a world of unbridled consumption and the maximization of profit. Faith challenges us towards a more responsible simplicity of life. Hearing the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth, faith moves us to want to do something to protect the very future of our planet, our common home. Faith also allows us to see more clearly that all these issues I've just mentioned, they're all connected. As Pope Benedict put it, the book of nature is one and indivisible. It takes in not only the environment, but also life, sexuality, marriage, the family, social relations. In a word, it's about integral human development. Our duties towards the environment are linked to our duties towards the human person, considered in himself and in relation to others. So faith is no mere private affair. It entails a social duty to help protect the future of humanity, no less. And the manifesto for faith in political discourse draws upon an integral vision of the dignity and vocation of the human person, which is linked to the common good. People of faith will want to present a consistent ethic of life based on the natural law, which includes, for example, the sacredness of all human life and the dignity of the person, the centrality of the family, the need for solidarity and a fair distribution of the world's goods, and care for the earth. Our vision is of a society marked by a culture of peace, justice, and care for all, especially the most vulnerable. But citizens of faith do not enter the public square with some sort of rule book or theory or code. We bring first and foremost our love and friendship for Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, and a passionate desire to share his good news. We want to present to the world God's truth and beauty and goodness so that they too will be able to experience a personal encounter with the joy of God's love. And that in turn can make a real difference to them and to society and help to make the world a better place. In all of this, Pope Benedict XVI cautions us not to think of the church as some kind of political agent. He says, the church cannot and must not take upon herself the political battle to bring about the most just society possible. She cannot and must not replace the state. The church recognizes the reality of secularization and supports the rightful autonomy of earthly affairs. But this is very different from secularism, which at times quite aggressively seeks to exclude altogether the voice of faith and religion from the public square. Clashes are likely to occur, especially when culture is characterized by a kind of moral relativism, where little is considered to be definitive, where the absolute rights of the individual are held to be paramount, and where there's a so-called illusion of self-sufficiency. In this context, people of faith who draw upon objective moral norms in certain matters can be portrayed as unjust, prejudiced, and as a threat to individual freedom and autonomy. Archbishop Rowan Williams has spoken about what he calls programmatic secularism, a kind of exclusive public orthodoxy in which any and every 
public manifestation of particular religious allegiance is to be ironed out so that everyone may share a clear public loyalty to the state, unclouded by private convictions, and any sign of such private convictions are rigorously banned from the public space. Such aggressive secularism brands faith as a kind of personal and private preference, which cannot stand alongside the supposedly neutral public order of rational persons. At best, it relegates faith to the privacy of our homes and churches. At worst, it tends towards intolerance and insists that in a democratic republic, the default position should be no societal acknowledgement of God. It sees the moral convictions of Christians in public life as automatically suspect, perhaps even illegitimate, because they are advanced by believers. Cardinal Parolin, who's the Secretary of State to Pope Francis, recently said, religious freedom is not only that of private belief and worship, it's the liberty to live both privately and publicly according to the ethical principles resulting from religious principles. And this is a great challenge, he said, in the globalized world where weak convictions also lower the general ethical level and in the name of a false concept of tolerance, it ends in persecuting those who defend their faith. I would support, on the other hand, a healthy secularity which admits a distinction between church and state, but allows the space for Christians to intervene in public debate and to make their arguments as brothers, sisters, and friends alongside those of all faiths and none. After all, the promotion of fundamental moral values is not confessional per se. These values are defended by the church precisely because they are human, even before they are Christian. They're rooted in the natural law and they're accessible to reason. They're views that can be shared by all people of goodwill. President Kennedy, in his inaugural address, identified as a defining issue the belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. And he was undoubtedly recognizing that the dignity of a person is rooted in their creation in the image and likeness of God. Such rights, therefore, have their basis in the natural law, in the divine law. And this is the crux of the church's concern today, that the state doesn't promote an erroneous understanding of the human person through, for example, introducing laws that would permit the destruction of innocent human life. Of course, many political questions remain open to being debated freely within the legitimate autonomy of the state, reaching very diverse conclusions. The church doesn't impose concrete technical remedies in circumstances that are purely contingent and subject to prudential consideration. However, there are matters where Catholics are bound, both by their faith and by reason, to give a consistent witness to the natural moral law. And such issues include the inviolability of human life at all its stages, from conception until natural death. The irreplaceable role in society of the family based upon marriage between a man and a woman and the right of parents to educate their children in accordance with their faith and beliefs. Catholic politicians, in particular, have an important but very challenging responsibility nowadays to support laws that uphold the dignity of every person made in God's image, even when it's not the popular thing to do. I would say to them, laws and policies that fundamentally contradict the moral law, such as those that would violate the life and integrity of any person at any stage, from conception to death, 
these laws and policies are fundamentally unjust and must be opposed, not only on the grounds of faith, but also by virtue of right reason. The demands of the life of a Christian are that believers would give a coherent witness to the gospel in every facet of their lives. People of faith must always be attentive to the danger of living parallel lives, whereby they compartmentalize their existence into spiritual sphere and secular sphere. Neither should they confuse their personal opinion with a well-formed Christian conscience. Professor Groom mentioned President Kennedy's 1960 speech on religion and politics in Houston. I think that speech contributed hugely to the phenomenon of politicians professing personal adherence to Christian moral principles, but holding that they couldn't give effect to those as legislators. Against that, I contend that truth, the truth is one and valid for all. Such fundamental values are not narrow Catholic preoccupations, but principles that redound to the good of every man and woman. The truth of the dignity of the human person and the fundamental right to life is discoverable by all people of goodwill. Interestingly, as Professor Groom said in that same Houston speech, President Kennedy did raise the prospect of resigning in the event of his official duties conflicting with his conscience. I think that's a reminder, a powerful reminder, that a Christian's foremost loyalty is to God. Obedience to God comes before obedience to men, as the scriptures say. St. Thomas More, the patron of politicians and statesmen, offers that salutary example of someone working diligently in the service of his country, but remembering that a Christian, his first allegiance is to the one who created us out of love and who died for our sins. I think in an Ireland where rising individualism is often accompanied by a growing disaffection and disillusionment with the leadership provided by both church leaders and public representatives. I think faith and politics need each other. The state will flourish if it is able to sustain itself as a community of communities. It will struggle if communities like faith communities who wish to play a full role in public life while exercising freely their spiritual, cultural, educational and charitable activities if they find themselves unwelcome, if they find themselves forced to remove all their religious and cultural symbols from public spaces, or even made to retreat altogether from public discourse. In my opinion, the marginalization of faith communities from public life, especially here in Ireland, where the Christian faith is so deeply embedded in our culture, landscape, language and identity, I think it surely wouldn't bode well for the future of our country, for our sense of who we are, where we've come from and who we want to be in the years ahead. So I'm really glad to have had this opportunity to speak tonight. And I'm very pleased that Noel Whelan invited me here. It was characteristically courageous of him. It was lovely to meet Sinead and his young son Seamus here tonight. I'm very grateful for that invitation. And I hope it helps to really open up this debate about the role of faith in our politics. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, who suggested I just follow that. Well, where to begin? 
Uh, I think I would like to begin uh, seriously by thanking uh, Larry for the invitation to speak and just by expressing my own personal condolences to Sinead and to Seamus on the loss of, and, and to all who knew him on the loss of Noel. And I was very proud to serve with Noel Whelan on the committee last year, the steering group for Together for Yes, that uh, brought about a successful 66.4% victory for repeal of the Eighth Amendment. And Noel, but I knew Noel a long time before that through the bar, through many different campaigns and uh, through different walks of life. And he was a, an extremely significant contributor to public life in this country. And, uh, you know, I think we all feel his loss. So just to say that. Um, could I, I suppose, perhaps approach my response to the Archbishop's speech in uh, three sections? First, I think his speech exposed a profound contradiction in what he was saying. On the one hand, he spoke about, approvingly, about the uh, position taken by President Kennedy in his, in, in his uh, Houston speech in 1960, which Tom so eloquently described. He spoke approvingly of Pope Benedict's comments that the church is not a political agent uh, and direct the need to recognize that the church cannot and must not replace the state. But on the other hand, particularly later in his speech, he cautioned against Catholic politicians having parallel lives and compartmentalising those lives into spiritual and secular spheres. He, he couldn't resist taking a pot shot at those legislators who continue to practice Catholic religion and who voted in favour of legalising abortion in Ireland. And if I was religious, and I'm not, I was brought up Catholic, but I'm now an atheist, a Catholic atheist. People always ask, if you're an Irish atheist, are you Catholic or Protestant? Catholic is the answer, so I was brought up Catholic. Uh, but if I was still religious, I would feel sorry for the church now in Ireland, because there's such a profound disconnection between the dogma of the church, as preached uh, in words that talk about sanctity of life and conception, that show no compassion for women in crisis pregnancy, for the many women, Archbishop, that I have met and that I know, who went through the trauma of a crisis pregnancy and nowhere to turn in this country. And happily, we've changed the law last year. And happily, as I say, we did that by a, a big majority. And happily, many colleagues and friends of mine in the Dáil and Shannon who are practicing Catholics voted with their conscience, their conscience, to change our law from a profound compassion for women. So I think that it's misguided to speak of, uh, of um, Catholics and politicians uh, having, uh, of Catholic politicians having to be guided by a conscience which the Archbishop has described as the voice of God in our hearts. I think he misses a, a, a key point as a lawyer, as, as any citizen should recognise, that in a democracy, in a republic, we must have, as JFK said in 1960, absolute separation of church and state. And we must have that because that protects freedom of religion. That protects each, of any, each and every one of us to practice our own religion, our own belief system, our own ethical views as we see fit. And JFK's words are very moving words in, in, in his description of the need to be a, 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 a politician for a politician who happens to be a Catholic, who's not going to be beholden to any uh, religious leader telling him what to do. And I think that's a very important key precept of, of, uh, of a republic, that we must have that separation. And that's a fundamental principle that protects all of us and that protects freedom of conscience and religion. And indeed, Article 44 of our Constitution does protect freedom of conscience and religion. So I think that's the first point, that, the church, that anyone who speaks on the role of the church must recognise that uh, fundamental point. Secondly, I think that it ill behoves spokespersons for the Catholic Church in Ireland to speak of the need for humility without acknowledging the immense harms done to so many people, particularly women and children, over so many generations by uh, those uh, uh, in religious orders who practiced such terrible abuses upon, uh, upon so many. And I should declare an interest as a barrister who represented many survivors of abuse before the redress boards in my time. And I think a key moment in our de development of our republic and of our relation between church and state was that speech by Enda Kenny in July 2011, where he spoke of the need to move away from a situation where we had a deferential 
kind of undue deference towards the Catholic Church. And indeed others have spoken of the Catholic Church in Ireland operating as a shadow welfare state throughout so many decades of our history, supplying the place of a negligent state in many respects, I, have, I grant that, but, uh, but nonetheless applying its dogma and its, uh, and its rules to so many people to su and, to such a, uh, and in, in, such a, in a way that was damaging to those of other religions and of none. And I think that a church with humility would acknowledge that that was an issue for a long time. I would refer to the words of Archbishop Dermot Martin, who has spoken so powerfully about the need for the church in moving into the future to recognise the need for change. He's spoken about tackling the cultural warriors of certainty who manipulate church leaders, who have, who have enabled an attitude of aloofness and clericalism to have given the image of an authoritarian, harsh and autocratic church strong words from a church leader, but I think those words show the sort of humility and acknowledgement of the past that is very important if we are to move on. And I think it's unfortunate that we see what I've called a creeping fundamentalism within lay people who speak uh, for uh, particular institutes and who speak uh, in, and put forward views uh, and dogmas of the Catholic Church. They are the sort of cultural warriors of certainty I think the Archbishop spoke about, Archbishop Dermot Martin. They haven't gone away, even if we've defeated them at the ballot box in 2015 and 2018. And indeed, I would say that rather than using a ballot box and Armalite strategy, they use a technique I call soapbox and crucifix by speaking through both the media and the pulpit to try and ensure their views prevail. And I don't think that that's appropriate in a republic. I would say finally that I think nonetheless that in any republic, in any secular republic, and I would say secularity is inherently healthy because it means separation of church and state. It's unfortunate that so many uh, people from, the ch from different churches feel the need always to preface the word secularity with the word aggressive. You can't be an atheist, you have to be a militant atheist. You can't be a secularist, you have to be an aggressive secularist. That's not secularism as I know it. That's not the sort of secularity that I and my colleagues in Dahl and Shannon, I think, adhere to for the most part. What we adhere to is a view that says, let's have dialogue with religions and with persons of, of, uh, of different ethical views and different ethical values. And I do, as the Archbishop Emin Martin does, I supported the Taoiseach's call for a new covenant for the 21st century, an ongoing dialogue. But let's not forget that in July of this year, when the Taoiseach convened that first plenary meeting, there were 28 groups there. Not, all, but not just faith groups, the humanists were represented, as were other groups from ethical, uh, ethical communities. Because no church has a monopoly on conscience, and no church has a monopoly on uh, communitarianism. I don't recognise the false dichotomy that was suggested in, the, in that speech between the love of God and a sort of... T um, I think decadence and unbridled consumption and maximisation of profits. I don't recognise that. That's a false dichotomy. That's setting up a straw man. It's setting up a straw man to suggest that you can only be uh, aggressive if you believe in a secular state. Rather, there is a middle way. There's a way forward that, uh, express, that sees humanism, that sees d the dignity of the human being from birth as a critical basis on which to premise your, uh, your state and your, uh, and your system of government. And that is the sort of ethical humanism that I adhere to. It doesn't derive from God, but it derives from a belief in my fellow human beings, women and men. And that's a hugely important driving force for me and indeed for many others. But it doesn't, we don't have to refer to a God or to an organised church in order to believe in that. We can drive, we can take on political drives to fight poverty, to fight the, uh, the, out, the, the consequences of unbridled capitalism, but we can do that from a humanist perspective, looking at the fundamental precept of love thy neighbour as something that, and I agree with Archbishop Emma Martin on this, that predates Christianity or an organised church and is a view that is shared by all people of goodwill. So I want to finish just by urging you all to, to, to just look, take a step back, Look at what Archbishop Evan Martin has said and see that contradiction. We have to keep faith out of the public sphere in the sense that he has suggested we should put it back in and it's been there all along. And can I just say I totally take issue with the idea that in some way those of faith are being marginalised or are being persecuted. In an Ireland where 90% of our schools remain under religious control and where we're fighting a huge battle to try and move towards divestment, the sort of divestment the Taoiseach spoke about the parents want uh, uh, in July. So you know, I, I certainly take issue with that. But I think we must be careful not to believe that this is 
that there is that marginalisation. Yes, there is an increased number of persons of no religion in our 10% in the last census, but 78% of our population still identify as Catholic. The Catholic Church is still immensely powerful in this state, but we have to be very careful that that power is not abused as it was in the past. We must keep faith out of politics, and to that I think JFK would indeed have said amen. Thank you. respond from here if everyone can, can hear me rather than the podium. In some ways I, I'm left wondering if I if I heard a different speech than uh, than Ivana heard. I mean I, I don't see uh, some of the things in the speech that, uh, that, that Ivana appears to have seen. Uh, for example, I think that uh, right throughout the speech I felt that the Archbishop was making the point very, very clear in terms of this idea of positive secularity, that all of the, all of the lights that are there for people of faith are also there for people to reach by reason, that there isn't this exclusivity around uh, people of faith feeling that we have a, an inner knowledge or a knowledge that is, uh, is, is not open to you as a person who, um, you know, from, from an atheist point of view, presumably orders your life according to, to reason. Uh, so that's, that's very clear, and I think that's in the essence of the, the Catholic tradition. I mean, I personally, you know, I, I'm not a fan of, of, of name calling, and, and I don't like terms like, like, like fundamentalists, because I, I think in telling a religious person, oh, that religious belief is fundamentalist, but there's another religious belief which is fine. I think there's a great danger that we create a culture whereby we have a kind of, a type of house trained Catholic, where there are certain types of Catholics who have certain types of values or articulations who are very welcome, but you know, those we exclude by terms like uh, fundamentalist, uh, that, that they're not welcome, that, that somehow their, their, their view is not welcome. Um, my, my accent will betray me like, like the Archbishop. I, I grew up uh, in the north of our country and would, would be very sensitive to, to sectarianism and would be very sensitive to, to the idea that uh, people are excluded because they hold uh, certain values. So I think that's, that's really important because I, I think we, we hear a lot about, you know, this is a republic, ergo, I'm never really sure quite what that means because, you know, the, the, uh, Ireland is a republic, France is a republic, Iran is a republic, America is a republic. These are four very, very different types of republics. So I think that that is something that, that needs to be unpacked uh, a lot. I think we as a people need to have a deeper conversation about what we see as the voice of faith, what we see as the role of faith. Uh, I think a lot of politicians uh, particularly opposition politicians, um, when they're in opposition, their minds change when they go into government, but when they're in opposition, they, they like when the church speaks out about homelessness. They like when the church speaks out about, about poverty. Uh, if the church speaks about the right to life of the unborn, for example, uh, they're uncomfortable around that, they, they don't like that. If the church speaks about marriage, for example, they, they don't like that. So I think politicians have to grow up a little bit as well. Um, maybe 50, 60 years ago, it probably took a lot of courage in Ireland to, to take on the church, to, to stand up uh, against the church. And I think our country is a better place because of, of those battles that, uh, that took place. I think there was an excessive deference to the Catholic Church, particularly in the, in the southern state, post-independence. It was not healthy for, for either church and state. And I think that a certain, uh, certain rebalancing of that was necessary. The Catholic Church certainly has been brought low in this country by the exposure of its own sins and crimes within the ranks. And I think that was something the Archbishop uh, touched on in his speech as well, in a way that a lot of church leaders in the past haven't been. The very fact that is obvious and clear to all of us, but you know, to hear someone like the Archbishop articulating that the, the simple fact is that the reputation of the church and the avoidance of scandal was put ahead of the needs of children. And I think that's, that's an important uh, acknowledgement from someone in a senior position in the church. So I think we do need this conversation around what kind of covenant we would have between church and state. I think it's interesting that the, the Taoiseach uses the word covenant, which obviously has certain, uh, certain religious underpinnings if we, uh, if, if we look to the Bible. 
there is always going to be people with different views. The, uh, the, the ballot box is the ballot box is never definitive. Um, it, to me, it's very interesting and it's striking that the, uh, the, the, the abortion referendum was, was carried by almost the exact same margin by which it was, it was defeated, uh, by, by which, sorry, the, the pro-life amendment was carried in 1983. And I would say just as the uh, campaigners for abortion in 1983, they didn't crawl away and hide under a stone for the rest of their life. I, I think you can be full sure that those who still continue to believe in the inalienable dignity of, of all human life from, from conception to natural death, but they won't crawl away either. Those, those people will continue to, to, have, to hold those values. I was asked on a radio program uh, recently, you know, what, why, why, don't I just, why don't I just change my view? Why don't I get with the program? Because, you know, the, uh, the referendum has been passed and uh, the, the people of Ireland have decided. But that, that, is, to, that is to exclude uh, the voices of those who, who have a different view. And I don't think we should be uh, afraid of people with different views. I think those things are, are very important and we should be having the, the, these deeper discussions in society. So I, I, I would say that the, uh, uh, the, the ballot box does not uh, definitively settle everything. I, I was also asked in the same radio discussion, a question I'm frequently asked, and I'm asked, you know, is the, uh, is the Catholic Church in Ireland out of touch? And I always answer it the same way when I'm asked. I say, it's certainly out of step. And if being out of step means you're out of touch, then uh, I, I, think, I think that's a different question. I mean, the Catholic Church, uh, what it proposes sometimes will be very popular, other times it will be it will be not so popular but the catholic church must continue to preach its message in season and out of season and i think we should be very we should be very glad about that in society even if some of us grumble about some of the teachings or some of the uh, pronouncements because in a world where everyone thinks alike i think no one thinks at all and the, the final thing i would say just on this point i think it's very important like i as a as a practicing catholic would find it very hard to extricate a, a part of myself who is who's not religious who is not catholic so i i cannot uh, be the sort of person who says well you know what um you know the, the, my Catholic life is something, but now I'm going here that collides with my Catholic life, you know, be it something that's, something that's contrary to my, my faith, and be it political, be it, be it moral, to say that I'm, I'm setting my Catholicism to the side, uh, I'm going to proceed forward. And I think to, to think that people of faith can do that is a fundamental misunderstanding of, of the depth to which faith informs everything that, uh, that, that, that people do. And there's no other aspect of our lives whereby we say, oh, you're a socialist, please leave socialism outside the door in this discussion, because we know that that informs people's values. And the, the same is true for, uh, for, 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 for people of faith. And I would just conclude to say, I think it's hugely important as well to, to stop seeing the church as, 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 as Roman collars, as, as bishops, as priests, Every, every, every Catholic who, who has an interest in, uh, in, in their faith is, is the church and has a, has a right to speak out about what they believe to be correct for the right order in their society. I certainly don't, uh, I certainly don't look up to uh, church leaders before deciding uh, what my particular view on a, on, on a, a political issue is. These, these are values uh, that come to us in terms of our, our, our shared commitment to, to the common good. dire warning from the organizers to keep this thing moving along to end on time. We did start a few minutes late, and if I could, I won't be invited again for doing this, I know I won't, uh, but maybe we could give just a minute, one minute, that'd be fun, uh, to each of our, to, to Archbishop well, Ivana, to if you want to respond, but to Archbishop Eamon uh, to respond as well. So let's just have a minute or two of response, and I will close, close with a closing thought. Just confess there to being an a la carte Catholic, if I'm correct. No, I'm fully carte. Fully carte. 
Uh, I think, in fact, if one looks at the full text of JFK's speech in Houston in 1960, one will see what is meant by being a politician who, uh, who is able to separate what their religious leaders are telling them from what their conscience is telling them to do in the public sphere. And he was very clear in that speech that he had indeed voted against church rules on a number of occasions over his previous time as a, uh, as a public representative. So I think that's hugely important, that of course there are ways of reconciling these things. I think yes, of course, yes, the church is patently out of step, the rules of the Catholic Church in so many areas, particularly pertaining to relationships, to sexuality, to gender, are completely out of touch with the way most Irish people now that live their lives. And I think that's the disconnection that, that church leaders with humility do recognise. And I think that's important that that is recognised. And that's the only way we can have the sort of dialogue that Leotisha Bradford spoke about, the New Covenant, where we do recognise that and where we recognise the need, for example, for greater diversity in schooling, where we recognise the need for the church to start pulling back from the huge amount of temporal power that it exercised for far too long in this country. And I think once we recognise that, once the church recognises that, then there's a way forward, and that is a way which protects people of all religions and of none to exercise our conscience and our freedom of belief in our own private spheres, leaving the state to govern in the public sphere. Thank you, Ivana. Archbishop. No, I, I'm just delighted to be here. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I think that you know, I remember when Noel, you know, asked asked me to come along here. He said, "I think it's important to know that we open up this discussion." Um, I hope that because I tried to present, to, you know. The question I was asked was, what is the role of faith in politics? I felt that I had to give or present that, you know, because of my role and position, to present that this is what the church believes its role is in politics. So I tried to do that as straight. I, I hope I'm a church leader with humility. <laughs> um, I presented it pretty straight down the line, okay? And I know that it's different to what other people think. Do you know? But, but I try to do it honestly, openly, uh, recognizing that there are other people with you know, completely different views. But I really do feel that the new Ireland, which should include both North and South, yes. okay, will need to find space for faith. Because we're not only talking about the, the Catholic Church in terms of Christian faith in this island, there are a lot of people who hold strong faith convictions who feel alienated from this state because of the way the Catholic Church dominated perhaps in the past. So we do need to open up the space and I'm just really pleased to have the opportunity and I hope people, you know, take, take a read through. I talked about healthy secularity. I did contrast that with a different thing called aggressive secularism. I don't use it. I think secularization is good. I have no problem with it, absolutely no problem with it. And I think a healthy secularity would allow space for the voice of faith, even in political debates, alongside other voices. So. Thank you all, reach your legs and left, and get on with the rest of the program. Thank you all, have a wonderful evening.